What's up, everyone? Welcome back for a brand new edition of Collider Ladies Night Pre-Party. I'm so excited to welcome Danielle Pinnock to the show because ghosts i've said this to your face before <laughs> ghost is one of the most delightful shows out there right now it's seriously every time i push play i know that series is going to put a smile on my face oh that means the world to I, and i speak for the whole cast thank you so much for supporting our show it means the world to us truly i mean it thank you for bringing joy into my world <laughs> all right we got to learn a little more about you. And we go back to the very, very beginning on Ladies Night. Every conversation always starts here. What would you say is the movie, the performance, personal experience you had, you name it, that first made you say, I have to be an actor and nothing else? You know, it was definitely the fifth grade show. We all had to do it. Elizabeth Marr School, shout out in Inglewood, New Jersey. And the entire class, we had to do Aladdin and the Wonderful Magical Lamp. Now thinking of it, we had no right doing that production, but this is pre-woke, okay? <laughs> I was cast as Jafar's sister. That's to show you how bootleg the production was. And uh, we had to get our own costumes and my grandma took me to Party City and we got this little outfit and she was like, mm, you better make this performance good. She's like, cause this costume was a lot of money. And I remember it was the first time that I had to sing. And my mom was like, this is gonna be her new after school activity. And I truly just fell in love with the ensemble um, relationship that we had and just live performance. And I've been doing it literally ever since. <laughs> oh, I have so many follow-up questions. So that was the moment when you realized you wanted to be an actor, but Absolutely. I know in this field, it's very difficult to find confidence in yourself. So whether it was something you did when you were a kid or maybe on a, an early professional gig, do you remember the moment when you were on set doing something and you really felt to yourself like, you know what, this feels great and I am good at it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my roots are in the theater, so it definitely has to be when I was on stage. And I had uh, been cast in this production called In Conflict in my undergrad, and it was a production that truly changed my life. We were interviewing um, men and women who had just come back from war and kind of what they were going through when they were back home with their families and PTSD. And that production truly changed my life because we were able to perform as them and tell their stories on stage. And that was when I knew this, you know, theater can change lives. TV and film can change lives. And they all, all of those uh, veterans got to come and see the show and they loved it and they brought their families and they were so thankful that we were able to share their stories and what they went through. And I was like, this is it. I'm doing this. If I can change the world in a small way, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And that was the moment that I knew that I wanted to be an actor for real, for real. What an incredible answer. That production sounds really incredible. It was insane. I mean, we were able, it was a little school production that ended up going, touring around the world. We went to Scotland's Edinburgh Fringe Festival. We went off Broadway for a year. It really changed my life. It was amazing. So at that point, was the goal to have a career on stage? Had you even considered screen work at that point? I had never considered screen work. It wasn't until 2016 that I was like, maybe I should think about this. But I was so self-conscious about my body and my little double chin and like, oh my gosh, what am I going to look on screen? Because the thing is, it's like with theater, you do eight shows a week. You may reach two people, <laughs> depending on what kind of night it is. Um, if you're working in your local black box theater, or you can reach, you know, 2000. And that's what I was used to, you know, 2000 was great. But to know that I would possibly be on TV, that could be millions, you know, and that was really scary for me. And I remember my agent at the time said, why don't you just try it out and see what happens? And I said, okay, I'm just going to do an audition. Let's just see. And my third audition was for a project that Whitney Cummings was producing for HBO. And I ended up screen testing for that project. And for those that don't know what screen testing is, basically that's like the biggest audition you can have. All the HBO producers are there, the possible directors, it's huge. So they flew me out from Chicago to LA 
And I remember seeing all the palm trees and I was like, oh, this is nice. I lo I'm loving it in LA. What's going on here? And uh, sadly, I didn't get that audition, but the casting director said, you know, your tape was so phenomenal and we loved working with you. We think you should move to Los Angeles. So I said, okay, great. I'm going to move this summer. <laughs> so I packed up my little apartment in Chicago. I was teaching actors like career, doing career consultations to like afford the money to get up here. So I was like, y'all, if you need any help trying to get into these casting offices, see me now because I'm gone. <laughs> And I remember auditioning for this production of Barbecue at the Geffen Playhouse um, that was being directed by Emmy winner Coleman Domingo. <laughs> and he loved my audition and said, you know, we want you in this play. We're bringing the, the Broadway cast, but can you understudy? And I said, absolutely. And hilariously enough, in that cast was Rebecca Wasaki, who plays Hetty in Ghosts. So we've known each other since 2016. So when I got cast in Ghosts, it felt like such a full circle moment to work with my homegirl again. And it just, it has been such an amazing couple of years being in LA, truly magical. I always love hearing about everyone's experience moving to LA because it could be a very ex uh, like exciting oh. but, but scary plunge to take. So when you first moved to LA, looking back now, what is something about starting a career in Hollywood that you wish you had done differently? But then also, what is something that you did do that made you feel like, all right, this was the right move and it gave me momentum? You know, I have to say as an actor, because, you know, we, we do work check to check. I wish I would have saved more <laughs> because the choice to move was so fast. I didn't I didn't have a savings really at all when I came here. And my husband and I we were sleeping on an air mattress for like the first year that we were in Los Angeles because our we had a whole thing with the movers. The movers kind of like held our furniture hostage until we could pay the full price. So I had to work in order to get the furniture back. That's a whole nother story. But as I would say for any actor that's coming out to LA, the dollar in the dream thing is cute, but come with some savings. Um, the thing that I felt like I did right is I had an agent when I came to LA. And I think a lot of times it really is really hard trying to find representation as an actor in Hollywood, because this is the acting Olympics. You know what I mean? That city is, I mean, the best of the best comes. So I remember I was in auditions with people that were in Living Single and somebody that won the Cinnamon Challenge on YouTube. Like there's no rhyme or reason as to who you're going to be in the room with these rooms with. So I would, my advice for any actors, please come out here, yes, with the savings, but also make sure that you have rep some sort of representation when you get here, whether it's a commercial agent or a manager or a theatrical agent, somebody that can at least get you the auditions because that's the, that's the only thing that you need as an actor. You just need to get in the room. That's it. <laughs> okay. So speaking of representation, I love talking about the actor agent relationship because I don't think we do that nearly often enough, but it's super important to get representation. And it's like, I imagine the second you have an offer in that respect, you want to take it, take it, take it. But you also want to find someone who like really understands you and the types of work that you're drawn to. So how did you kind of navigate that situation when you were hooking up with the right agent? Yes. So actually when I was in Second City, I was a part of a diversity fellowship called the Bob Curry Fellowship, where I met some of like some of my very dear friends that I'm still friends with today. And it was an incredible opportunity where, you know, for a couple of months, you can take free classes at Second City and it would end in a showcase that was um, produced by NBC. So everyone from LA came down, everyone from New York came down. And I, that was the first time that I was able to do my characters in a comedy space and for pe other people to see it other than my theater friends. And I did some characters from my one woman show called Body Courage. And this was a project that I was working on for five years where I would go out, interview people and bring their stories to the stage. And those stories range from a little girl on the South side of Chicago who was getting bullied because of her weight to a Northern Irish priest who was dealing with early onset Parkinson's to my grandmother, who is the biggest comedian <laughs> that I know. Um, and I had interviewed like 350 people worldwide. And sh these stories really did help me. It did elevate my career in a real way. Um, so when I was doing Second City, my manager, who's still my manager to this day, Frank Gonzalez, scouted me 
and said, you know, you should come to L.A. And I was like, mm, I'm not really feeling L.A., but you can still represent me. <laughs> I was like, it's nice to have somebody that's, a, you know, an L.A. manager. And Frank, I have to say, like, he is truly family. You know, all the no's, we've cried together, we've laughed together, we've celebrated wins together. Um, he is one of my greatest support systems that I have. And I like when I tell actors, you know, when they're looking for representation, you want to find someone that's going to be your rock in this industry, it, it, whether that's your agent, whether that's your manager, um, because there are so many no's <laughs> that you go through often, you know, you deal with probably more no's than you deal with yeses. So when those yeses do come, you want to be able to celebrate them and you want to be able to have, I would find like myself as a plus size black woman, like I wanted somebody that understood me outside of the stereotypical roles that I may have been seen for in the past. I wanted someone that understood me as a full blown artist, you know, and that's exactly what Frank does for me. And um, I just think he's, I feel so lucky to have him and so blessed. And I know when I win my Emmy and when I win my Oscar, cause I believe it's going to happen one day, he's definitely going to be one of the people I thank for sure. <laughs> I manifest things all the time. So I like that you just said that. Yes. Um, let's highlight some other TV titles before we go into Ghost. So of all of the shows that you had done before Ghost, is there anything that you saw a series regular on one of those productions do that you kind of filed away and now find yourself applying to your work on Ghost, whether it's, you know, how you perform in your role or just how you carry yourself on set as a series regular? You know, I had the great opportunity of being in the crossover episode of How to Get Away with Murder and Scandal. And it was a very small role. I was playing a hairdresser and I got to see great Titans work. Viola Davis and Carrie Washington are stunning performers. I mean, they truly are about the craft. I mean, I remember Viola opening her book um, that had all of her pages of what she's going to do for the day. Everything was highlighted, notated, little post-it notes, little character descriptions. Carrie was like, I think I want to feel my way through the scene. Viola, let's workshop this. And seeing how they worked as an ensemble, just in that brief episode, I said, this is what I want to carry with me um, the next time that I book, uh, the, the next time and the one time <laughs> that I book a series regular. And I was like, I always want to be prepared. I always want to show up for my crew, for my cast. I want to be collaborative. I want to make sure that I do enough research for my character, that I can come to set and be ready to play. And these are all things that I have used for ghosts. I mean, when I, when I was first cast as Alberta, who was the 1920s Prohibition era ghost, I said, okay, I want to put some respect on the names of the artists that came before me, the artists from the Harlem Renaissance. And I was like, I need to get into singing classes because I'm not a natural born singer. So I got into singing classes. I got into dance classes. I um, was doing all kinds of reading and watching documentaries about the period because I really wanted to just entrench myself and pay homage to all of these incredible creatives, Bessie Smith, Ma Rainey. And I was like, Alberta would have been playing with the best of them, you know? So those are definitely things that I learned from that small experience that I had with Carrie Washington and Viola Davis that I definitely, definitely try to bring to ghosts as well. Okay, so jumping into ghosts and applying something that you just described about the way, the different ways that the two of them work, of everyone in the ghost ensemble, which two actors have the most polar opposite ways of approaching the work where when you're their scene partner, you know your onset experience is going to feel creatively different? So I definitely feel like working with Rebecca Wasaki is truly a masterclass. Rebecca is all about the musicality of a scene and she is so precise in her performance. And so anytime I work with Rebecca, I know that I got to come correct. <laughs> you know what I mean? I got to come correct. I can't, I can't half-ass it. Sorry. <laughs> that word is not allowed. I got to come in fully and ready to go. Um, and the other one I would probably say is <laughs> I love 
working with Richie Moriarty, who plays Pete on the show, and I know Alberta and him have a little thing going, um, but he's such an improv guy, and that's kind of the world that I come from as well, too. So we're able to just improvise and brainstorm and just like, he's always surprising me every time and that just it just gives me so much joy so they definitely work differently for sure because they they feel their way through the scene differently but they're both a blast to work with all right i kind of jumped ahead there i want to go back to the very very beginning of ghost because one of the one of the things about uh the making of a tv show that always fascinates me is like the idea of you filming a pilot and then having to go on hiatus for a period of time while you wait to hear more news because that period of time could be beneficial in terms of like reflecting and then changing some of what you do when you hit set again so is there anything you learned from filming the pilot that you were able to apply to your future work on the show yes absolutely Absolutely. I mean, that was, you know, the second pilot that I'd ever filmed in my career, the first one being Young Sheldon. So and the thing with Young Sheldon that was different is that <laughs> they said, oh, this is an untitled project. They were keeping it so under wraps. So we didn't even really know what we were, what we were filming. And then I was like, this kind of feels like Big Bang Theory a little bit, but I'm not quite sure. Um, but for Ghosts, I knew exactly what was happening. And I was so excited to just be on set because we were in the thick of the pandemic. I had been home making bread and all kinds of recipes like the rest of the world. And I'd just been in my pajamas and I was excited to see people again. So when we got on set, it felt like summer camp. We were all just like busting at the seams. And we're like, hi, <laughs> we're out of our house. Yes. You know, like we were all so excited to just like collaborate and work together and laugh and give hugs, even though we had to be six feet away with the little virtual hugs, you know, like to be around other people. I think that is the magic that people are seeing on this series. We actually love each other for real. Like this is our family. And I think we got so lucky with this group because nobody has any ego on this set. You know, we we all appreciate our crew. We all appreciate the people that are coming in, the guest stars. We are just so excited to work and to make this show the best show we can. I mean, that's the vibe that was on set during the pilot. And I remember um, we were all still trying to figure out the rules of like, can ghosts touch things? Can, how do we work this green screen now with the VFX? How do we walk through <laughs> walls? Because none of us had ever really worked on things like this before. And there's a moment in the pilot that I will just share with you because I wasn't aware that we couldn't touch things where I'm literally hanging on to the bedside post as the woman, the older woman is going up um, and ascending. And I was just there chilling like, yeah, Alberta would just be chilling. I was like, oh, wait, hold on. We can't, we can't hold on to that, my bad. I can't wait to go back and look for that now. <laughs> it's in the cold open. I didn't even fully process that that way, that every single step of the way you need to be considering what you are actually able to like, touch and how you're able to stand in this environment as a ghost but it's a very obvious thing to consider yes and I, it's so great cool it's really cool now because a lot of the fans online have been like taking notes as to what are the ghost rules what's the world of the show so i'm curious to see you know fingers crossed if we get a season three season four if someone can publish some sort of book online of uh, what we can do and what we can't do because we'll definitely use that on set for sure <laughs> When you get a season three and season yes, four. Yes, let's do it. <laughs> All right. So another part of the process of making a TV show that fascinates me because I, I originally started film focused. And when you're making a movie, you get the entire script and you know your characters are from beginning to end. But when you're working on a series, you're finding out like new essential details about your character every single step of the way. So based on what we know about Alberta thus far without spoiling anything, is there any particular detail that you were told that I guess changed the way you viewed the character the most, where when that episode came and went, you kind of had a, a different view of her? Yes, absolutely. I would have to say that Alberta, I mean, in the series is just a brassy, delicious diva. You know, she's very, very sure of herself. This is very different from me in life because I'm kind of like a little bit of an introvert and I'm always unsure of what I'm doing. But Alberta has such an incredible confidence. And I think the thing that I was interested in seeing is 
when is this woman vulnerable and who is she vulnerable with? Uh, because that just gives us a different shade of her that we've never seen. And I think all of the times that she brags about her bootlegger boyfriends and all the kind of murders they may have, may or may not have done, um, these men never treated her well, you know? And I think in that Alberta's podcast, I mean, sorry, in the, because y'all haven't seen that one yet. Let me not share too much. Hold on, you almost caught me. In the <laughs> Alberta's fan <laughs> episode, um, getting to learn more about her father and her family through Creepy Todd and all the toenails and the back tattoos that he had, it just made me feel like this is a woman the reason she is, she's tough as nails because of the time period that she came up in, which was, you know, as fabulous as it is, it was also really shady <laughs> when it came to black performers, black people in general. Um, but also she just wants to make her family proud. And I think that was where it tapped into the vulnerability for me. It's like, wow, this woman, you know, she doesn't want to be famous just because she wants, even in death, even in her afterlife, she wants to make her name for herself. She wants her, her father, her mom to really be proud of her and to accept her for the performer that she is. Um, I also get to see, we also get to see a shade of vulnerability with her relationship with Pete, which we'll get to flesh out a little bit more in season two and episode two, Alberta's podcast. You'll get to see a little, a little stuff. You know, <laughs> we're gonna talk, we're gonna talk about that episode. Um, before before I do that, and we'll put a proper spoiler warning on that as yeah. well. But before I even touch that episode, I I did want to ask because you already brought up the improv on the show, and there there's really just like so many laugh out loud moments in this show where like I almost can't recover from them <laughs> where they happen, and I find myself like messing with my with, with my head and thinking about them after and laughing about it like five minutes after the joke has come and gone. So is there ever a time on set when, I guess when you broke the most and had the hardest time recovering from it, where you're like, shit, am I going to be able to get through this scene? I mean, the dinner scene in the D&D &D episode by far was the one that I struggled with the most because Devin talking about all the crazy things that he just screams about as Thorfinn just took me out. And I was like, how are we supposed to be in a scene where this man is screaming about ram testicles or whatever he was talking about. And I was like, this is out of control, y'all. This is funny. This is funny stuff. And once I start laughing, the tears, they just come down. I just think Thorfinn is the funniest character. I mean, to be honest, and I know my cast is going to come for me for this. He just makes me laugh so much because he just doesn't care. He is who he is. He kind of reminds me of some of my uncles. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they just kind of doing what they want to do and saying what they want to say. And they don't care how it's received. But I just think he Thorfinn just takes me down every time. Every time. <laughs> very much understand this. All right. Here, here it's coming right now. This is happening. I'm going to put up the spoiler warning for anyone who's not fully caught up on all the ghost episode released thus far, which includes season two, episode two, Alberta's podcast. This is the point in time when you push pause, you go watch it, then you come back and push play and the video starts right here. It is that easy. Um, I, actually, before I even get to that one moment from episode one that just absolutely killed me, it's, I think you had just said something to Sam in the scene about the pitch of her voice and Rose lowers her voice. And like, I just, like, I was sitting in a room by myself. There was no one to see this, but I just lost it and just could not recover from that for whatever reason. Oh my gosh. Rose is doing some fantastic things this season. I mean, the physical comedy with Rose this year is so elevated and she is bringing so many laughs this season. Rose McIver, I mean, I just, I love working with her so much and Ukarsh and Bukar, like, they are comedic geniuses to me. So I'm excited for the audiences to see what they have in store because if you love that moment, there are way more to come. <laughs> I am so excited and I would believe it knowing them and this group overall. All right. So 
in Alberta's podcast, she she very clearly doesn't want the secret to get out when they find her diary. And, you know, she she fears everyone knowing that she's a fraud. And it isn't until she comes to realize what really happened until Sam tells her otherwise. So that was kind of making me wonder after she had done that, after she had ratted Clara out, how do you think back in the day that she carried that secret herself? Was it something that she was always like, like, I'm panicked that someone's going to find out what I did? Or is it, you know, embracing the opportunity that she always knew she deserved for that period of time? Yeah, for sure. I definitely think, you know, snitches get stitches. I mean, that's still a a term that we have today, you know? So I think especially in the community, um, that's just, it just rang true. And I think probably even more so in the 1920s, like she created an entire song called Low Down Rant. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's something that she didn't want to be known as. It had like a funk and bad taste to it. So when it's now re- revealed hundreds of years later, she's embarrassed. And I think, again, as we were talking about earlier, that vulnerability, we really do see the vulnerability shine with her in this episode. Uh, we get to see a beautiful flashback of her in the 1920s singing, which I am so, I haven't seen yet, but I was so nervous to see because I am not a singer. So I'm hoping it came out all right. <laughs> It's quite good. I'm very impressed by that. Um, actually, going back to something you said earlier, because you did say you were you were taking singing lessons. So is there anything you learned during those lessons and, you know, how you're able to, like, use and manipulate your own voice that you find yourself being able to apply to scenes even when you're not singing? Yeah, um, the musicality of Alberta. I mean, she's a singer, obviously. So I think I love to play with her range. I love to go really, really low. I love to go really high with her when she's upset. Um, So there are definitely some things that I've been adding in this season for sure. Um, But I mean, even singing that song as an actor was very vulnerable for me because I'm not a singer, you know what I mean? So I was like, I hope I could just at least do her justice and every song they give me moving forward will be a little bit better than the last. So I'm excited for people to see it and I can't wait for uh, people to find out a little bit more about our girl and everybody on Twitter last season was like, who murdered Alberta? Who murdered Alberta? So we'll get a little taste of that um, in this episode. All right. So this this is a difficult question. Then I don't know how far you are into shooting season two at this point, but just like theorizing, because I don't like you guys haven't finished, right? No, we have not finished. Mm -mm. Okay, so just for your own head, just for a little theorizing, do you think that there really is a chance that Clara has killed Alberta or is it really going to be suspect one of many realistic possibilities? There she is suspect one. I'll leave it at that. There's there's a few different. uh pieces to this puzzle (laughs) and we'll find out more in the season and to be honest i don't know any more truly like i will find out when we get an episode and next time call me and we'll do another interview (laughs) all right so this next question then is going to be a little more uh theorizing given how well you know the character but have you put much thought into how knowing who killed her will change alberta if uh you know she'll actually gain something and grow in any way when she finds out who it was or if that's something that like knowing won't do anything anyway Yeah, I mean, I think for hundreds of years, I mean, for the hundred years that she's been there, she's been telling the ghost that she thinks she's murdered, you know, and they've been gaslighting her the whole time. I mean, Hetty's like, sis, you died of a heart attack, leave it alone. And a lot of these ghosts probably were there when it happened. So I'm curious to see um, as we get farther along in the episodes, which ghost knows more information than what they're telling. My money is on sass. After the Trevor's Pants episode, I just, I think he is just like full of some of the most meaningful secrets. I think there. Sass has a lot of secrets. I got I think I think so too. <laughs> um I'll I'll give you one more question before I jump into a couple rapid fire ones. Have okay. you heard anything from Lizzo? I've been following all of this. <sighs> I haven't heard anything from Lizzo, but the whole cast, we're all going to get on TikTok in a couple of days and do a big call to action. So hopefully, hopefully she responds back. It would be just a dream come true to have her guest star on the show. I know she's on tour right now and has probably zero availability, but if not this season, Hopefully for season three, if we get one, fingers crossed. 
I believe. I believe it's going to happen. I'm rooting for you. All right. Before I let you go, a couple of uh, like silly or random questions here. They're all harmless. The, fir- the first one, this has become like my new favorite question to ask during every single interview because I'm obsessed with the uh, zombie movies. So Love. let's I'm going to I'm going to set a scene for you. There is a zombie outbreak on the set of ghosts. You can pick two co-stars to team up with. Who do you pick to give yourself the best chance of surviving? And the real people, not their characters. The real people. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Devin for sure. Makes sense. Devin is the muscle. <laughs> Devin is the muscle. And I'm also probably going to say Sheila just because Sheila is my best friend and I love her so much. And like, I'll be like, girl, we got to get our husbands. We got to get the husbands. Hurry up. Like, get Josh, get, let's get Jack. Like, Sheila has some tricks of her sleeve where I feel like she would be able to distract a zombie while I'm doing something. So, yeah, those are the two people I'm bringing without question. Yeah. I'll follow, I'll follow that up then. In a zombie apocalypse, what's your greatest skill? How are you contributing to the group so you all survive? Uh, to be honest, I would die instantly. <laughs> I'm such a klutz. I literally will fall over my own shoelaces. And obviously, like, I would just be like, oh, my gosh, it's a zombie and just stay there and freeze. So I would need somebody to be like, sis, we got to go. We, we can't just like look at them. We need to leave now. I would be a mess. I would probably be like the one that scavenges, like find, like like does the scavenger hunt for food, um, for everybody. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go to the nearest Rite Aid. I can pick up what I can pick up. Like I was a Girl Scout, so I feel like I can do that stuff. I can make my own fires. I can do all that stuff. But when it comes to, you know, actually fighting them, it's gonna be tricky. I honestly think you you just brought the best skill to the table, though, saying you were a Girl Scout, because that's usually the thing everyone overlooks. It's like, yeah. I can run away from the zombies, and I think I, I would, you know, be able to fight to a degree. I can't start a fight. And, like, I yeah. have contacts. When my contacts dry up, I can't see. I would die in a second. Yeah, oh, my gosh. Speaking of glasses, I, I wear bifocals, so it would just be a disaster. It would be a mess. We we would be wearing glasses. The glasses would fall off, and someone would step no. on them in the first act, and that'd be it. Now it would be crickets gone. <laughs> She's gone, but not forgotten. Zombies, rest in peace. It would be a mess. <laughs> All right, here's a completely different type of question for you. Uh, so this one was inspired by the character Death in the Sandman, who I absolutely <laughs> love. But what is what is a, a seemingly silly like? little thing in your life, something that someone else out there would think is totally insignificant, but it brightens your day on a regular basis? Huh. Well, this is the thing. I play a lot of go fish with my husband. <laughs> Look, I tell you, we're really boring people here. Like this Alberta character is just so much more to life than my actual life. I love a good snack and I love a good card game. I love games. I love Scrabble. I love Uno. I love Jenga. I love all of the old games. And like when I come back from work, having my little snacks and playing a game with my husband is like the best thing ever. And it brings me so much joy. Like I love books, but I love Jenga more. <laughs> so, all right, you brought up Scrabble. So does that mean you play Wordle? Yeah. Oh, I was playing Wordle. I had to stop. I had to stop working because it was getting, it was getting too, because I, there was one, there was one day where I was like, Wordle's about to take me out. Wordle's going to take me out. And I'm going to start writing letters to the person that created Wordle being like, this word was too hard. I was very close. I needed to let Wordle go. Gone okay. <laughs> that That's probably the smarter way to go. Whereas I just accumulate Wordle like offshoots or other <laughs> like I do wordle I do quirtle I do framed I do like oh, this is the one now Jack does everything all of them there's one that does the songs as well too it plays like the five seconds of a song I was doing that but our cast is really good at Scrabble and we were actually playing Scrabble online and it got so competitive that we all had to stop because we were like we're gonna it, it, we're not gonna have a good season two if we keep this if we keep this Scrabble game up it was getting ruthless it was getting ruthless please tell me you've all played bananagrams what is that oh my gosh 
What is I'm about to add to the chat? Oh today. my! I don't even know if I can even like describe it quickly and succinctly, but it's basically like a Scrabble-like type of game where there's no board, but you get all the tiles and you all have to build onto the same board, making words, and whoever finishes all their tiles first wins. And like I love, I love Scrabble. I get like intense about Bananagrams because it's got like that quick moving uh, feel yeah. to it. I'm telling you, I'm about to, I'm about to do it. I'm adding. I, it. I feel like okay. Bananagram. Right. The next, the next time I interview you all in a group, as much as I love ghosts, we're yeah. not going to talk about ghosts. I'm going to bring my Bananagrams yeah. uh, bag, <laughs> and we're going so much to attention. Play. I'm telling you, that interview is going to be tense. It's going to be giving I'm, you know, Venice Film Festival <laughs> off a banana. <laughs> and then when we're done, everyone will give us a 14 minute standing ovation. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> All right. I got to let you go, but I have high hopes. We'll talk in the future because I feel a very long run for this very special show. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for the show and for sharing some of your journey with us on Ladies Night. Thank you so much for having me. This was such a blast. You're the best.